New England is one of the earliest English settlements in North America, with some of the oldest historical spots in the U.S., so it's not surprising that the region is home to many urban legends. It is perhaps the most overlooked state in the Northeast when it comes to paranormal. The Granite State does hold its fair share of ghosts, ghouls, and other supernatural happenings that will make you look over your shoulder when you hear a rustle in the woods. Join me today as we take a look at 10 of the many urban legends New Hampshire has to offer. Mount Washington Hotel was built in 1902 by coal and railroad tycoon Joseph Stickney. It was created to be the ultimate wealthy man's paradise. Everyone who visited the hotel fell in love with it, especially Joseph's wife, Caroline. Caroline was known to play the always glamorous hostess and according to rumors, would hide in the shadows in order to catch a sneak peek of her rich and famous visitors' clothing in order to outdress them. During that time, it was common for the hotel to host guests like Babe Ruth, Alfred Hitchcock, John D. Rockefeller, and even the wealthy Vanderbilt family. After all, Mount Washington Hotel had a reputation for being the perfect hidden destination for celebrities wanting to remain under radar. Unfortunately, one year after opening, Joseph died from a heart attack. Caroline refused to sell the hotel, which, in her mind, was a living piece of her marriage to Joseph. Caroline eventually went on to marry Prince Amin Fancini Lachin and became known as Princess Caroline. Although her new home was in Paris, she continued to spend summers at Mount Washington Hotel. Caroline died on November 2nd, 1936. But according to many people, Princess Caroline is still at Mount Washington Hotel. Soon after her death, staff and guests started reporting seeing a woman who strongly resembled Princess Caroline roaming the hotel and the grounds. Because of all the reports through the years, the hotel began leaving a seat for her in the hall during the evening meal. There are said to be many hot spots for paranormal activity throughout the hotel, but room 314 is supposed to be the most active. In this suite is a large four-poster bed that once belonged to Caroline and Joseph. Reports from the suite include disembodied voices of a woman talking in the dark, the feeling of your hair being played with, lamps turning on and off by themselves, and some have reported seeing Caroline sitting on the edge of the bed, brushing her hair. Mount Washington isn't just home for ghosts. The Brenton wood surrounding the hotel is reported to be teeming with Bigfoot activity as well. The Isle of Shoals is located off the coast of Portsmouth, about 10 miles, but on a clear day, you can see it from Route 1A. There are nine islands that make up the famous but tiny Isles of Shoals. Although there is no camping facilities on the island, there is one hotel for visitors. The Isle of Shoals has long been known to be haunted. Nathaniel Hawthorne wrote about some of the hauntings in his 1952 journal. There is reported to be a phantom ship known as Isidore that appears near the island. It appears for only a few minutes at a time and has been spotted as far away as Rye and Portsmouth. Around 1813, people say that the Spanish ship 
Saganto sunk off of Smitty Nose Island, but contemporary evidence says it was actually the Concepcion from Cadiz. At least 14 men died in the disaster, and people have claimed that the ghost ship appears just off of Smitty Nose in mid-January, which is the anniversary of the shipwreck. On Star Island is the popular Haunted Hotel Oceanic Hotel. Reports from the hotel claim that spirits manifest on the third and the fourth floors. People have reported hearing furniture move and what sounds like someone searching through dresser drawers. Although the attic is above the fourth floor, there is nothing up there. Other reports include doors opening and closing on their own and the ghost of a man in the men's bathroom on the first floor. In 1873, a gruesome murder happened in a house on Smitty Nose Island. Two Norwegian girls were butchered by Louis Wagner. A few years later, the house did burn down. According to reports, Wagner's ghost still haunts the site. Both the girls are buried in South Cemetery in Portsmouth, another haunted location in New Hampshire. On Lunging Island, legends say Blackbeard, or at least his 13th or 15th wife, who was abandoned on the island, still roam there. The ghost wife is called Lady Ghost and is reported to be a milky figure. Usually, she is reported to be heard whispering, he will return. She has also been reported on Smitty Nose Island. According to the legends, Blackbeard's treasure is also buried on the island and his ghost has been reported to be seen searching or protecting it. White Island is reported to have several ghosts, including another of Blackbeard's wives. She has been reported to be seen wandering around in a white dress. Another ghost reported is of a woman screaming and crying around Moody's cave. According to legends, in the 17th century, she was trying to hide with her baby during an attack by the Native Americans. Deep in the woods, atop a hill in Salem, New Hampshire, is the site shrouded in mystery and legend known as America Stonehenge or Mystery Hill. Mystery Hill includes mysterious rock formations, a warn of man-made caves and chambers, and stone walls that stretch across the hilltop. The origin and purpose of the structures has been debated for many years, raising more questions than answers. Some people claim the structure to be a 4,000-year-old megalithic astronomical complex built by Native Americans and others claim it to be the lost monastery for Irish monks or even a creation of the ancient Middle Eastern people. Yet, some believe it to be the work of 18th and 19th century farmers. Regardless, no one knows for sure. Mystery Hill, although named America's Stonehenge, is actually nothing like Stonehenge at all other than being made of stone. The site was originally owned by the colonial family, the Peters, who mostly ignored it and assumed it to be the work of early settlers or natives. In 1937, William Goodwin purchased the site. Goodwin began looking for evidence of Vikings and became convinced the site was made by Irish monks who had been fleeing the Vikings and managed to arrive in America long before Christopher Columbus. In 1956, the Sutton family bought it and changed the name to America Stonehenge. They started tours and a gift shop. In 1976, Barry Fell wrote about it in his book, America BC, claiming it was the site of an ancient Orwam Phoenician and Iberian scripts. Historians and archaeologists do agree on some elements of Mystery Hill. 
They both say that some of the stones were quarried using primitive stone on stone techniques and two reputable surveyors vouch for the alignment of the stones that may be consistent with astronomy of a few thousand years ago. It seems though that most likely the site is simply a combination of Native American habitation, colonial usage and building, and many amateur archaeologists doing some wistful thinking and hoaxing. The complete truth may never be known for certain, but what is certain is that people will continue to try to solve the mysteries behind America's Stonehenge. Gilson Road in Nashua, New Hampshire holds a couple of legends. The first being one of the America's most haunted cemeteries. Gilson Road Cemetery started as a small family cemetery around colonial times, and according to legends, the stone wall enclosed a farmhouse at one time. One day, the house burnt down and the fire victims were buried in a plot near the charred remains of the house. Eventually, another house was built on the site, but suffered the same fate as the first. Just like the previous fire, the victims were buried close to the home's remains. After the last fire, people gave up on building at that location and turned it into a rural cemetery. Early records that were mostly oral traditions before contemporary records existed suggest that Gilson Road area was the site of two large Native American battles. According to reports, visitors to the cemetery have seen apparitions, experienced random cold spots, had compasses and EMF anomalies, heard and recorded disembodied voices, and captured orbs and photographs. Gilson Road also has another legend attached to it. According to the legends, if you walk a little further up the road slightly northwest and shout, Betty Gilson, I have your baby, she will appear. Betty is usually described as looking around 30 years old, dressed in colonial clothing. Some people report that she will appear in the middle of the road, but most reports say that she appears hiding behind a tree, sometimes peering out to see who's calling her. The first thing people report seeing is the cap she wears, along with part of her face and her hand grasping the tree. Kacheco Mill, located in Dover, New Hampshire, is a five-story building that was built in 1890 that manufactured cotton. In January of 1907, while the sprinkler system was down for repairs on the fourth floor, a fire broke out. Unfortunately, such tragedies were common during the time and cotton mills would often catch fire. The fire spread quickly and many workers became trapped on the fourth and fifth floors in the darkness because the power was shut down. The mill only had one fire escape and the panicked employees attempted to find in the darkness and smoke which led many to attempt to escape by jumping from windows. Firefighters from Portsmouth and Dover battled the blaze for 36 hours because of several problems. They found that their ladders couldn't reach the mill's upper floors and the water from the fire engines froze almost immediately from the cold temperatures. To make things worse, curious people drove their buggies over the hoses to see the fire, which ended up cutting many of those hoses. Miraculously, only six lives were lost, and the large million-dollar building was only partially destroyed. Funny thing is, just days before the fire, the mutual insurance company had just declared the mill excellent when it came to safety. The cause of the fire has never been determined, but it's possible the friction from the large machines might have set it off, or possibly human error. Through the years, the old mill has been used to manufacture fire engines, 
and rifles. Today, it houses offices and apartments as well as ghosts. Many people believe that the fire in 1907 is the reason for at least some of the hauntings. There are also many eyewitness accounts that seem to point to the building having a portal which allows many different spirits to come and go. The most common report is of strange lights on the upper floors when the building is empty. Before modern renovations, people have also reported seeing lights on in the basement at the time when the entrances to those rooms were blocked. Other reports include disembodied voices, especially in the towers that house the stairwells, and hearing the old mill's machinery start up or shut down, with many claiming that after a few minutes, one very loud machine takes over. Chief Chikira is said to have lived with his young son in Tamworth area in the early 1700s. When most of his tribe moved to Canada to avoid further conflict with settlers, after the Battle of Lovewell's Pond in 1725, Chief Chikura stayed behind. According to legends, the chief became friendly with a settler named Cornelius Campbell and his family. One day, the chief was called away on tribal business and asked the Campbells to watch over his son while he was away. While in the Campbell's care, the chief's son found and drank a bottle of poison that was made to get rid of troublesome foxes, and he died. Upon his return, the chief learned of his son's death and vowed revenge on the Campbell family. Soon after, when Cornelius returned home, he found his wife and children slain. Suspecting the chief, he pursued them up the mountain. Knowing there was no escape and he would die, the chief climbed to the highest boulder, raised his arms to the sky, and shouted, A curse upon ye, white man! May the great spirit curse ye when he speaks in the clouds, and his words are fire. Chikuri had a son, and ye killed him while the sky looked bright. Lightning blast your crops, wind and fire destroy your dwellings. The evil spirit breathe death upon your cattle. Your graves lie in the warpath of the Indian. Panthers howl and wolves fatten over your bones. Chakura goes to the great spirit. His curse stays with the white man. The chief then leapt off the mountain, falling to his death on the rocks below. According to legends, the curse still remains in the area today. Pine Hill Cemetery in Hollis, New Hampshire, is rumored to have a lot of paranormal activity and is known locally as Blood Cemetery. This plot of land that holds about 300 dead was donated by Benjamin Parker Jr. in 1779. Today, there are several markers that have not survived the test of time and weatherization. The area where these markers are placed now stand bare with no indication of who resides there in death. Towards the center of the cemetery is the Blood family plot which attributes to the cemetery's nickname. It is believed that the spirit of Abel Blood haunts the cemetery. Some legends claim the Blood family was murdered and Abel's spirit is roaming the grounds looking for his wife. On Abel Blood's headstone, there is a hand with a finger pointing towards the heavens. It has been reported that at night, the hand and the finger will point down instead. People have also reported mysterious knocking throughout the cemetery, disembodied voices, and orbs and photographs. Another legend in the area is along the road that runs beside the cemetery. 
According to legend, sometime in the 1800s, a family was murdered in their home along the road close to the cemetery. People have reported seeing a young boy attempting to flag down vehicles for assistance, but when they stop, the boy vanishes. The Blake House was built in 1837 by Levi Haskell as a commercial building. The first floor had room for two stores, and the second floor was the living quarters. Haskell rented storage space in the basement, and the attic was used to store wooden boxes, and later rooms were added and rented out. Through the years, the building had several owners, each using it for their own businesses, and in 1865, Amos J. Blake purchased it. Amos was a prominent citizen of Fitzwilliam. He was a community leader, a town official, and state legislator. He was also the town moderator and lawyer. Amos lived here until his death in 1928, as did his son Leroy until his death in 1965. Leroy's cousin, Ida Mae Northrop, gave the house to the Fitzwilliam Historical Society in 1966 with the stipulation that the Blake name be used somehow permanently in the museum's name. According to the current caretaker, Terry Harlow, the Amos J. Blake house has about 11 ghosts as well as a ghost cat. She claims she witnessed the cat disappear right before her eyes. Staff and visitors have reported feeling of not being alone when nobody is around, unexplainable sounds, disembodied voices, objects moving on their own, and even ectoplasm. Chase House in Portsmouth, New Hampshire was built in the late 19th century as a home for orphaned children and eventually became a court-appointed children's home. The ghosts reported here are not of the children that were housed here, but of the tortured soul who took her own life. It is claimed that a young girl that was living in the children's home hanged herself in her room. To this day, her spirit is reported to be seen wandering the hallway. There are also reports of her screams coming from her former bedroom, doors unlocking on their own, and the electricity to the building turning on and off by itself. The Saco River begins in the mountains of New Hampshire and winds its way through southern Maine, finally ending in the Atlantic Ocean. The river is rough and dangerous and has been known to take the lives of those who risk the waters. According to legends, during the summer of 1675, the wife and infant son of Squando chief of the Sacco tribe was traveling by canoe near the mouth of the river when they encountered three drunken sailors. The rowdy sailors snatched the baby from their mother and threw it into the river to see if the stories were true that native babies were natural swimmers. The mother was able to rescue the infant. When the mother returned to the tribe, she spoke with the chief, who then told the medicine man to place a curse on the river. The curse place was that three or more white men shall die in the river every year. According to reports, the curse has held true and there have been many drownings in the rivers throughout the years. Perhaps it's just the nature of the beast and the carelessness of those who brave the waters. But then again, maybe there is something to the curse after all. 